Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Lindsay Medlin. I am the marketing coordinator here at Straightaway. So I will be facilitating today's festivities. Um, I have Sherry Johnson and Debbie Jameis with me. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, everyone is in listen only mode. So if you have a question, um, there's a little question box down at the bottom right of your screen should be and it'll give you a chance to type in questions that we will go through at the end. Um, we'll save about five or ten minutes toward the end to run through everything. Um, and once the webinar is complete we will send a PDF of all of the slides um, and an invitation to be part of the SPIN uh, or the Straightaway Professional Instructor Network, so SPIN. Um, and with that I will kick it over to Sherry and Debbie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherry Johnson. I serve as a Chief Clinical Officer with Straight Away. I have lots of years of education, both in nursing um, and nursing clinical practice, and I am here today just to share with you some of the things I've learned throughout my career. Hi, and I'm Debbie Damus. Um, I am a clinical consultant to Straight Away. Uh, prior to this, I was with Relias. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Relias. Been working in the long-term care post-acute field for over 30 years. So welcome to our webinar and hope you find something to help you at the end of the day. So I thought I would start by explaining to you a little bit who Straight Away is. Many of you may have not have heard of us, uh, but we are a company of Bertelsmann and Bertelsmann um, is a German-based family-owned business. They've been around for over 100 years. They have different brands in their portfolio, such as Penguin Random House, a huge book publisher, and BMG, which stands for Bertelsmann Music Group. And some of you may remember back in the day, you would get a postcard, and you would put stickers on it to uh, choose your eight CDs or your cassette tapes for a dollar if you promised to purchase a certain number over the next year. Well, that's BMG, Bertelsmann Music Group. So they go back a long time as well. So about five years ago, Bertelsmann started the Bertelsmann Education Group, as you can see on this slide here. And in that education group, um, the, per the Relias was the first purchase that was made to start this group. And again, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Relias as the leading provider of continuing education for healthcare professionals and compliance training for healthcare organizations. Straight Away is lucky enough to be a sister company to Relias, and our focus is on initial CNA certification programs and the provision of instructors to teach the programs if an organization has that need. So, Sherry, want to take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Debbie. So today we're going to just go over learning styles and teaching styles and kind of the synergy that exists between both of those. The adult learner, unlike children who rely on others to tell them what's important, as adult learners, we decide for ourselves what we think is important. As adults, we certainly bring our life experiences to every new learning opportunity. We tend to take the information that's being presented and compare it with what we believe and what we've experienced to determine if it's correct in our own minds. Children, being like learning sponges, they just soak everything in and typically believe what they're told. So as adults, we certainly have that opportunity to kind of test things out as we approach learning. Information also needs to be practical for the adult learner, meaning that they need to be able to use it immediately. When we learn new skills like taking a pulse or blood pressure, we want to practice and get good at it. We need to learn it and we need to be able to use it right away. Adults have also strong viewpoints um, based on their life experiences. I think you can see this come out when we teach CNAs um, and others, things like resident rights, privacy, informed consent, or even hospice end of life decisions. These topics bring along a lot of emotional energy. So cultural sensitivity, that's another one that brings strong viewpoints. When you're teaching these kind of concepts um, and ideas to adults, we really need as instructors um, to know that it can be really challenging. And we need to keep that in mind when we're working with the adult learner. Finally, adults, they want to learn um, and share their own expertise. They need to be part of that learning process. So acknowledging um, to your students the contributions that they make when they share their knowledge, it's really important. Debbie, let's talk about the different learning styles that our learners have. Great idea, Sherry. It's a good point to do that. So the most important aspect of teaching adults is knowing how they learn. If you are an experienced instructor, 
you already have discovered that for some students you need to explain things a little more or in a different way but for others they need to touch feel and or see what you're talking about there are three types of adult learners visual auditory and kinesthetic learners it is possible for learners to be all of these at one point or another, depending on the situation and what they are learning. Let's take a deeper look into each one of these. So visual learners, they are painting the picture in their head as you speak. For instance, if you are talking about providing range of motion and you are just talking about it, the visual learner will not necessarily be able to picture that. If on the other hand, you are either demonstrating or showing images of the procedure, procedure, the visual learner will see that in their mind and be able to assimilate that easier than if they were just being told about it. So a good example of this is my anatomy book. As, as old as it is, there is orange and yellow and pink and blue and green all over that book. Each color had a special meaning to me that when I needed to, I could recall those pages visually in my mind along with their colors and when I needed it. How many times have you ever been to a conference and you received a handout? Um, that's usually the first thing people ask. That's why we mentioned it here. You know, we're going to give you the handouts as well. Most of us like these handouts because they provide us with a chance to look through them and visualize what will be talked about and become familiar with the materials prior to attending. If the handout is not available, it can cause those of us like myself that's a visual learner some angst. Being able to see and re read the presentation really does help a visual learner to learn better. Auditory learners um, are a little bit different. We've all been around these people in a meeting where they're talking and they seem to be going nowhere in their thoughts. They just keep saying things out loud. Um, but in reality, they actually are going somewhere. This is how they learn and sharpen their thoughts. Hearing the spoken word either by others or by themselves is most important to them and not only helps them learn but helps them problem solve as well. Auditory learners like word associations to help them remember. For instance, I have a light switch that is outside my closet. It has two switches. One is for the inside of the closet and the other the outside of the closet. I remember these by saying up and in and down and out because otherwise I just get confused and I keep turning on the wrong light. Um, a long time ago when I was back in nursing school, I had my tape recorder at the ready on my desk to tape the lectures as I took notes in class and then would immediately go home and rewrite my notes while listening to the tapes. That helped reinforce my learning. Kinesthetic learners like to be involved with the information. So if you're a data person and you love working with spreadsheets, you like to manipulate the data in different ways to look at it from all different perspectives. It tells a different story every time you shuffle it around. Kinesthetic learners also take a lot of notes. This reinforces the learning process for them. I had just mentioned my tape recorder. Sometimes I would listen and rewrite my notes more than once since the simple act of writing the information helped me, helped me remember it much better. And then listening to it reinforced it. So the chart on the left shows the three kinds of learners that we just discussed, but notice that there is significant overlap. As I mentioned earlier, there is not only one way that adults learn. It depends on what is being presented and where they're at for the day from, from a mental perspective. So for those that we have our, you know, like I said, our auditory, our visual, and our kinesthetic learners and all that overlap in the center, we have people that are kinesthetic audio learners. They learn by seeing, hearing, and doing. Those that are visual auditory learners learn by reading and writing. Visual kinesthetic learners need to see and touch. And when you combine all that together in that center of the circle where all three of them intersect, you have someone who needs to see, see hear, touch, and do. Recall, recall that learning is not one size fits all. Just as we don't feel at our physical peak every day, we are the same way with our learning. Some days we may be more auditory, some days more kinesthetic. The way topics are presented should be varied as well. HIPAA, for example, should not always pre be presented in a lecture format. So we talked a little bit about the different ways adult learners learn and what that means to their ability to grasp new concepts. Let's talk a little bit about how that works with the information you need to teach them as instructors. So as the instructor, you have specific topics and tasks that you must teach students 
that is why you're here after all. I mentioned HIPAA a minute ago, and I don't mean to pick on HIPAA, but at the end of the day, HIPAA probably is not the most exciting topic that you have to teach. So how do we transmit the knowledge to students in a way that will resonate with them? Maybe talking about something relating to social media and how a HIPAA violation might occur, or have them talk about an experience they had. As CNA instructors, our objective is to turn out the best CNAs we can. We are not just teaching to the test. Yes, it's, we know it's all important to pass the certification exam, but if we teach them how to provide safe and high quality care, we are teaching them how to pass the test. As we talked about, your students have various types of learning styles. In addition, some students may bring personal issues with them that will affect their success in the class. These may not, some people may not be able to read very well, and, and these things are not necessarily going to be obvious to you when you're running your class, but keeping alert to, to signs of them will provide you with the opportunity to provide them with extra support. Every instructor or inspire, aspiring instructor I've talked to wants to be sure their students excel. They will do whatever that means to help them. That is what makes this group of nurses so unique. Nurses in general are nurturers and want to take care of people. Being a CNA instructor and help, helping educate the next generation of caregivers has been described to me as some of the most fulfilling work an instructor has done in their career. So let's take a look at these retention stats. They can be a little bit discouraging. You know, forgetting um, isn't always the learner's fault. How information is presented can either hinder or spur um, that memory on. So the first bullet here, the first top, after one hour, people retain less than half of the information presented. I mean, that really makes us stop and pause and think about how we're doing things. So people often forget um, because they never actually learned it in the first place, whether it was their short attention span or the, just that the message was unclear. Sometimes those are factors to blame. Interference occurs when information is not learned deeply. You know, when it isn't able to apply to your day-to-day -day life, it just doesn't stick with you. Information in our memories can also decay or fade over time if it's not accessed enough. The old saying, use it or lose it, I think is so true here. To learn, the brain builds on existing knowledge, like we talked about earlier in that adult learner. You find an anchor point on where you can attach new information. That's why, really, practice makes perfect. Another thing we know, as Debbie talked earlier, sleep can affect our memory. How, how well prepared we are doesn't necessarily mean how much time we've spent studying, but how well we're taking care of ourselves. Scientists recommend a full night's sleep within the first 30 hours of learning something new. This is something that certainly we can share with our students, but how many of them are working full time, maybe have a family, and are taking classes? That can be a real challenge. So I think as instructors, we need to both take care of ourselves, but also relay that information to our students. They need to be well rested um, and re-energized for class each day. So the statistics on this slide can really drive that point home. How you teach is critical to the student's ability to retain the information and use it for both testing and more importantly, for caring for our residents. Let's look at um, how we demonstrate that knowledge once it's been learned. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you're gonna see cognition and behavior. So we know that cognitive learning is the, the earlier stages and behavioral, how they demonstrate that is what we'll see um, later as we're testing. So many of you probably use Bloom's taxonomy when you're building learning objectives for courses. That's necessary so that we can measure our learning outcomes. So going from the, the lower to the top, we see the first level is knows. We test how they know something by written exams or quizzes. Learners um, are assessed this throughout many courses that we teach and just in day to day. This can be done through maybe lists or matching or multiple choice type questions. The second tier in Miller's pyramid is knows how. How is that information used? It's, um, how do they analyze it? How do they interpret it? And then how do they apply it in patient care situations? For this type of assessment, maybe you use case studies or actual resident situations in your own facilities. Perhaps your scenario is a resident experiencing a change of condition. The vital signs reported for this patient might be the blood pressure is 190 over 100. So through written testing or class discussions, you can evaluate how the student's gonna use that information. 
Do they report it immediately to the nurse? Do they just kind of take it and move on and not do anything with it? That's something that you're going to be able then to see, do they know how? The next one is shows how, and that requires a learner to demonstrate the integration of knowledge into skills for successful um, clinical performance. So our competency assessments when we do return demonstration. Certainly one way that we do that, let's say we've talked about a, a resident that had a, a CVA or a stroke. So we might talk about, can you show me how you're going to address this resident? They've got right-sided weakness. So the steps that they have to do in performing that skill is done as a return demonstration. The next phase then is the does. Do they do this in their skills um, setting? I mean, in their skill setting, in their clinical setting, when they're out there working on the floor and you're observing them both while they're in class and then actually when they're working, can they transfer that knowledge on to, do they um, include all the before and after steps of a, of a clinical skill? Do they knock on the door? Do they introduce themselves? Do they do all those things and put it together? So those are the levels of how we see um, knowledge transfer and knowledge acquisition. Do they know? Do they know how? Do they show how? And then do they do it in their practice? So Debbie, how does it all come together? That's a great question, Sherry. So uh, we promised you a, a little short presentation. So this is kind of where we're going to wrap it up here. So when we look at the different things of how we pull this together from the learning perspective and from the instructor's perspective, find out what motivates your students. You know, there is a reason why they're there. What are their goals and their aspirations? A seasoned instructor may already have a good feel for this, but new instructors may be still trying to figure out how to do this. However, it's really important to know why they are there since adult learners want to learn what is relevant to them. Are they attending this class to start a career in nursing because they care about people? In other words, how will this information be useful to them in the future? They need to know as adults how they're going to be able to use the information being presented to them. And adults need to know how it works. Allow time for learning the skills like we do through our skills practice labs, but also have times when students can practice on their own. Encourage them to make their own bed at home like they are taught in class. I mean, is there any other way to make a bed other than with hospital corners? I've been making my bed that way for over 30 years. Um, but hey, that's just me. Uh, have them practice transfers and range of motion with their family members when away from the classroom. Don't let them just sit there and listen to you talk. You may have a great voice and all, but for those of us that know Charlie Brown going way back and the way his mother sounded, that's what you're gonna sound like to your students after a while if you're just talking at them. You know, you'll have lost them and you will not have their attention any longer. Make it fun and memorable. Have competitions, provide prizes for meeting certain metrics. Have a medical related joke of the day or term. For instance, try writing the word tumor on your whiteboard with the definition more than one, an extra pair. Get it? Anyway, my feeble sense of humor. And on that note, does anyone have any questions that we can answer for you today? I'd just like to remind people that if you do have a question, you can um, type it into the question box in the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in. So, okay, let me start at the top. Okay, so I am a newer instructor. How can I find out about the different learning styles of my students? Sherry, I'll go ahead and take that one. Okay. That's, that's a really great question. There are numerous websites out there where you can take an online quiz and it will kind of, be the, by the way you're answering the questions, kind of tell you what kind of a learner you are. Um, I've done those myself and, and I would recommend that maybe at the beginning of a class, you have your students do the same thing. So not only does it make you aware of what kind of learner that they are, it makes them be aware because they all these websites also give you study hints and learning tips. If you're um, a visual learner, these are the things that you need to be aware of and, and such. There's a couple that I, I can mention. One is educationplanner.org. Uh, and there's another one called howtostudy.com and another one called howtolearn.com. All of those, and I'm sure there's a plethora more of those, but these are the ones that I've been to recently 
um, and they do provide you with a lot of detail and ask a lot of questions. So that might be one way you can do that. Okay. All right, I've got a few more. So what can I do to motivate my students more in class? That's a good question too, because sometimes we don't know why they're not being motivated. Sometimes maybe they're not being challenged enough. Sometimes they just might not be in the mood for learning that day. You know, getting to know your students is probably at the bottom of that. But one way you can do that too, is I've already mentioned kind of a couple in, in the previous slide, like having competitions and prizes and those types of things. But if you've got a student that is very ahead of the curve, so to speak, and they're very personable and they know their stuff, you know, maybe have them, you know, take on a little extra in the class as being a lead for a certain skill or being a mentor um, to another student. Um, just kind of getting them involved more and taking advantage of their their skill set that they bring to the table. Okay. What are some best practices for increased learning retention amongst a variety of students? Uh, that's a great question as well. I mean, you might be doing some playback scenarios. So maybe you put a scenario out there and say, what would you do in this scenario and see what their thought process, because not only is it important to learn what they're, they're learning and learning the, the rote knowledge, they need to learn how to apply that. So if they're put in a situation, um, for instance, if you have an Alzheimer's resident, what would you do if they started to become combative? You know, or you flip it around a little bit and you say, you know, you have an Alzheimer's resident and they become combative with you, what would you do? You know, or you have them just make up the scenario of how it would end if you have a resident that, being, that is being combative and they start throwing things at you, you know, how are you going to handle that? So basically kind of having a role play, those types of things, and having them actually act out what they're wanting to do, what, what would happen, you know, what would you do, you know, th those kind of things help reinforce the knowledge. And then help you also then find out where there might be a learning deficit or maybe we could learn to do something a little bit better. Debbie, that's a great example. Another best practice I've seen and used often in the clinical practice in the skills lab is to have kind of a triad where you have three students, one acts as the instructor, one acts as a student, and one acts as, well, one is the patient, one is the um, student, and one is the observer. So maybe you're doing a skills practice on uh, range of motion. So you have the one student act as the resident, the other student act um, you know, in the student role and do the range of motion. And the third observer maybe has the skills checklist and goes through and watches them and then provides feedback. And it's really been um, an eye opener for the students when they're in the different roles to be the observer and to give feedback. It's funny how they can pick out so quick when something is missed or something's not done. Um, or they learn like, wow, you did that really well. And they learn to give feedback to each other in a non-threatening situation and learn from each other in that way. So I think that peer learning is another really good way for um, you to use in the skills lab in the, kind of the adult learning methodology. That's a great point, Sherry. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, I've got a few more up here. How can I manage language barriers? Some students need me to speak extremely slowly, but it can hold the lecture and rest of the class back. Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> that is a challenge. Um, so I, I've approached this one a couple different ways. One is, is while you're um, interviewing students that are coming into your class, certainly you're going to get to know them a little bit and you're going to know their language skills and um, you're going to have that opportunity just to, to learn where everybody is, both in their kind of basic learning and their communication styles. And then I typically will pull those students aside from time to time during class, um, before or after class, and just give them the opportunity to ask me questions one-on-one, -on -one, to make sure they're keeping up and um, not falling behind. Sometimes those students Sure, they want you to speak slowly, but sometimes they're not going to say anything because they don't want to call out their own deficits in language. So there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one kind of outside the normal classroom. When you have questions or you have those kind of student mix in your class too, the other thing that I've done and found success with is setting some ground rules at the beginning. 
to talk about, you know, the way you're going to manage the classroom when it is more of a presentation or a lecture. Make sure you have handouts and things that can go along with it. And also you use a parking lot. So you establish with the students that you're going to take questions throughout, but if we get off track or there's too many questions, sometimes it's going to have to go in a parking lot that you're going to address after class or on breaks or things like that to, to be able to keep up with the rest of the class. Those are some of the ways I've handled those situations. Sharing. Okay. How do I read about? Sorry. How do I redirect back to focusing on the lessons at hand when some students are more enthusiastic about the next steps of their career, i.e., LPN, RN, MD school? Uh, th this is Debbie. I think I think it's important for them to recognize that those are all great aspirations going on to be an LPN and RN, and, and we're hoping really that, that that's what they want to do, that this is an entry level into healthcare and an introduction. But I think it's really important that we make sure they understand that this is a very important first step because the skills that they're learning here today in CNA school will be the foundation of wherever they take their career. So they, if they were not being a CNA, they would learn this in nursing school. So they're learning it now, so it'll be more like a refresher when they get there and they won't have to be as stressed when they get to that level. But this is extremely important to the foundation of their career. That's great, Demi, thank you. All right, one last question. I have a learning styles quiz that my students do on the first day of class, but I often don't know what to do with that information. How do I make use of this info? I think that, you know, we talked earlier that you as the instructor, I think it's more of a, a, a discovery type option. So you discover the types of learners you're your students are and then if you have mostly auditory learners in your class then you can gear toward the auditory learners you know you can I mean obviously everybody's not one learner but it gives them the opportunity to figure out how they need to best learn and maybe it becomes a small discussion point in your course uh, about hey you know I noticed that you know 50% of us are auditory learners you know tell me what that means to you how is that going to help you study better and it's also going to help you better as the instructor because you'll know how to better present materials um, look at your your clinical skills you know whatever that means I think it's a just a good discovery opportunity so everybody's on the same page it's kind of like knowing who's who in, in the room when you go to school you like to know you know where do you live what do you do you know, it's kind of like finding out who the group is about. That's great. Another place that I have used that kind of quizzes and information is definitely get the baseline of where everybody is. And then one of your first sessions that you're going to have in the first few days is all about communication. So that's one of the topics that you can let them, they self-identified maybe their top learning style. So how do you use that when you speak with other staff members? How do you use that when you talk to residents? If they're typically a visual learner and you've got to go help them do something, how do you use that information? And I have found that that just leads to really good conversations and people gain a greater awareness of their own style, but then also how to use that in communicating with others. Great. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'll say that it seems like it's time to wrap up. We're right at 2.30. Um, and if you do think of another question um, after the webinar is over, you have Sherry and Debbie's emails right there. Um, and like I mentioned before, I will be sending um, a PDF of all of these slides and also the uh, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube and I'll send out a link to that as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Debbie. Absolutely. And everyone enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Have a great day.